In this lecture, we're going to talk about externalities. Um, this unit, Unit 5, deals with the imperfect market structures and then some of the side effects of the imperfect market structures and some of the ways that the government gets involved in market economies to try to, um, to, try to make up for some of those side effects and remedy those side effects of production and consumption in imperfect markets. So um, that's where this topic of externalities comes in. In competitive markets, price and quantity is determined by supply and demand. So supply, or the cost of producing um, items, includes the monetary and implicit costs of production. And the demand curve, which represents the benefits of consumption, are going to represent the monetary benefits to consumers and the utility. Remember, the marginal utility curve is the individual's demand curve for the item. So therefore, the equilibrium tells us when the production costs equal the consumption benefits. So in competitive markets, when markets can produce at their equilibrium quantity and sell at their equilibrium price, um, life is good. Things are ideal. But inefficiencies result when supply does not equal demand and the costs and benefits are, of production are not equal. So when we're not at our equilibrium, deadweight loss exists and consumption and production benefits are not going to be equal to one another. So externalities are spillover effects of production or consumption. And this is going to happen in imperfect markets. Individuals impose costs on or provide benefits for others, but don't have an economic incentive to take those costs or benefits into account. And externalities can have positive or negative effects on society as a whole and must include the private costs and benefits that are incurred. So um, left to itself, a market economy will not arrive at the socially optimal quantity of output because some of the private costs or private benefits incurred in a transaction are, are not going to be accounted for. So there's no incentive to take these, these extra costs and benefits into account. The marginal social cost curve is the additional cost imposed on society by consuming or producing another unit of, of a, an item. And the marginal social cost curve um, is represented here with an upward sloping curve. Um, this, is, this is also referred to possibly as the supply curve here. Marginal, remember in, in markets, marginal cost curve is the supply curve. So the marginal social cost curve is what we could equate to the supply curve here. And the marginal social benefit curve is the additional gain to society by consuming or producing additional units of product. Um, the marginal benefit curve or the marginal utility curve is like the demand curve. So we could, we could equate the marginal social benefit curve to the demand curve. So we have kind of the supply of and demand for um, products here represented by the marginal social benefit and the marginal social cost curves. And the socially optimal quantity of output of any good or service is going to occur when marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit of another unit of output. So here's our optimal quantity of output and the optimal price that can be charged for this good or service. Now, pollution um, is an issue that's, that represents a negative externality situation. Um, and this is a, an interesting debate because environmental activists argue for a hundred percent reduction in, con in um, pollution. So, Economists would tell you, though, that it's not always a good idea to clean up the en environment as much as possible because the opportunity cost of the cleanup gets extremely high as we attempt to clean up um, successive amounts of pollution. So the environment should be cleaned up to the point where marginal social benefit equals the marginal social cost of the cleanup. Let's take a look at this graphically. So the reason zero pollution is not ideal is we only want to clean up pollution to the point where the marginal social benefit curve equals the marginal social cost curve. So the marginal social benefit curve represents firms willingness to pay for pollution. This represents the additional benefits to a firm for each additional unit of pollution that they 
that they um, produce. So ideally, if you, if you were a firm, you would want to pollute until marginal social benefits equal zero, until you, you don't incur any more benefits from any more pollution. And that's obviously not what's best for society, but the marginal social cost curve, again, gives us the additional cost of each additional unit of pollution. And you can see that the greater the quantity of pollution, the harder it is for the natural world to handle the damage, and the additional cost to society rise. So the more pollution, the more costly it is to society, um, and the less benefits a firm gets from, from cleaning that up. So the optimal amount of pollution, according to this graph, is when mar the marginal social cost of another unit of pollution equals the marginal social benefit of cleaning that unit of pollution up. As we move from point A to point B, up the marginal social benefit curve towards less pollution, it becomes progressively harder to achieve lower amounts of pollution and therefore more expensive to achieve these lower amounts of pollution because the marginal social benefit um, is higher than the marginal social cost. So to produce less pollution, a polluter would have to spend a greater amount of money on pollution reducing equipment or pollution reducing methods therefore the marginal social benefit of producing that unit of pollution is high. So it's very costly to, pr to clean up this pollution and, and we're only going to do so to the point where the benefits equal the cost of another unit of pollution cleanup. Alright, so let's look at negative versus positive externalities and, and, um, and what they look like graphically. Uh, a negative externality is an uncompensated cost that a consumer or firm imposes on others and the additional costs are not accounted for. So um, one example of a negative externality could be if you walked into the classroom and I had just um, released, I had just dropped a stink bomb. Remember stink bombs from like elementary school and they made the whole school stink like rotten, I don't know, rotten garbage. So if you walked into the classroom and someone had just released a stink bomb in the classroom. Um, that would have negative external effects. It would affect you because you have to come sit in the classroom and you're not the one that released the stink bomb, but you would have to smell those that, that negative or disgusting smell. So um, negative externalities have costs that are imposed on other people that the producer and consumer don't account for when they're determining how much of the good or service to produce and consume and there are production and consumption externalities. So <clears throat> a production externality happens when the producer is imposing external costs on other people in the production of the item and in that situation the marginal social cost is higher than the private cost to the firm that's doing the producing so this would be like you know pollution or something like that and therefore the optimal amount of the good that should be produced in society, the optimal amount would be less than the market will produce on its own because when those external costs are accounted for, um, the, the equilibrium would be lower. A consumption externality is when the consumer um, has external, has less benefits um, than, than would be recognized and so the marginal social benefits are less than the marginal private benefits and the equilibrium quantity, if those, those extra um, benefits were forced to be accounted for, the decrease in benefits to society, I should say those external costs, um, the equilibrium quantity in the market would be less than, than would be um, with, no, with no regulation. So the market, the bottom line here, <laughs> this is kind of confusing, the, the, the market will overproduce when the externality is not taken into account. When these extra costs are not forced to be accounted for, then the market left to itself is going to produce more of the item than we really want to be produced. Okay, some examples of negative externalities. A couple production externalities would be like pollution, like I mentioned. Noise from an airport, like let's say you live by an airport and it's very loud when those planes take off and land every day and you have to listen to that noise if you live by the airport but you're not causing that noise you still have to deal with it or some con um, consumption externalities would be like 
when you're driving, the congestion that occurs or the pollution that occurs because you're choosing to drive and that's going to affect other people that don't drive. And smoking. Smoking obviously affects other people. If you are a smoker, you are creating secondhand smoke and now they even talk about thirdhand smoke, which is the smoke residue on your clothing and furniture that it can affect people. Um, they say thirdhand smoke is just as dangerous as secondhand smoke. And both of those are more dangerous than firsthand smoke. So the government, the role of the government then in a market economy is to limit these negative externalities. Okay? And the government does so. One of the ways they can do so is by imposing a tax on the producer or consumer. And this is called a Pigouvian tax because that's named after the man who thought of this brilliant idea. So by taxing production or taxing consumption of these goods and services that produce negative external effects, um, we try to decrease consumption of the item and get back to where the market would like production and consumption to be. Okay, the other type of externality is positive externalities. Um, these are good things. So a positive externality is a benefit that an individual or firm confers on others without receiving compensation. And these additional benefits are not accounted for. So um, positive externalities are when other people reap benefits from something you do and they don't they don't do anything to get those benefits but they're just getting them and so that's awesome and so for a production externality what this looks like is the marginal social costs to the society as a whole are going to be less than the marginal social cost of the private firms private firms are going to pay more than society has to and for consumption externalities, the marginal social benefits to the, you know, to the society as a whole are greater than the private benefits to the consumers who are involved in the production or consumption of the item. So what you can see here is the market will underproduce when the externality is not taken into account. So we would love for more of this good or service to be produced than will be produced um, on, on its own in the market. Some examples of positive externalities are public safety and education. These are production externalities um, where you know production of these items is going to have many, many positive external effects. And consumption externalities would be things like immunizations and vaccines because, you know, again, the more people who are immunized, um, the more protected a whole group of people will be. And clean water. So one more note about education in the production externality column there is studies have shown that violent crime rates are much lower in areas where there is a higher percentage of college educated people living. So that's one statistic that when, when you're going to buy a home, one statistic you might look for is how many college educated people live in the area because then crime rates tend to be lower. So that's again another positive external benefit of the production of more education. So the government likes to promote more of these things to happen in markets because they you know they have so many positive external effects so to try to increase production and consumption of these types of things um, the government may provide subsidies to the producer or consumer and again this is named after the guy who thought of this brilliant idea so these are called Peguvian subsidies and these subsidies will encourage more production and consumption of these goods and services alright and that is the end